feel like I'm in the WW wrestling here. <laughs> the Rock should come on here. So. Throw down with Hulk Hogan. Yes. So, with that being said, how about we just kind of talk about the movie a little bit, and then we'll launch right into some questions for you guys. I've got somebody that's going to bring around a microphone. Any questions that you've got, all that we ask, put your hand up and we will get to as many as we can, because I'm pretty sure that some of you out there have seen the movie. And some of you might have some questions about the movie. But what I kind of want to ask, and you know, this is just from me personally. What kind of nightmares do you guys have? Oh, God. <laughs> toy? Toy? What scares Toy? You know, flying in at 5 a.m. in the morning, I then going back to sleep this morning, I had some wicked nightmares. And it was all about, it was cyclical. Like, cyclical. It just kept happening over and over. I had a scene in four. <laughs> well, well, you know, Toy, that's what I love about our film. Is, no, no, really, the, my favorite dream nightmare sequence in all the films is like what Toy just described. It's when Danny and, and Lisa leave the drive-in, the grave-in. They leave it and they get in the truck, into Danny's truck, and then it just keeps repeating on this, this loop from hell. Oh, crap. But that's that's what real nightmares are like, right, Toy? That's exactly right. But someone was chasing me, and I was like, I, and I could not get out of the dream, and then my husband called and woke me up, and I was like, <gasps> and he's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, I got scared. So really, I had a nightmare just this morning when I arrived here for this convention. Was it a newlywed nightmare? Yeah. Oh, wow. I guess I'm a newlywed. Oh, It's like saying husband, like it's like it's like it's she's really used to it. I really love saying it. I do. I go hubby in my phone, it's hubs. And I and I share his contact with someone, so they say every time he calls her, he it comes up hubs. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, I have had a recurring nightmare ever since I saw Planet of the Apes, the original. And um, it is a recurring nightmare. It, it, it doesn't even necessarily happen every year. But it has happened since I saw Planet of the Apes, I think I was probably eight or something. And, and, and what, what it is, is I'm at the zoo with my mother. I'm in the arms of my mother. We're looking at the monkeys. And then the big gorilla reaches his big hairy arms through the bars and pulls me out of my mother's arms. He's, gray, he's holding me and he takes me to the back of his cell, his cage, opens the door and it's Planet of the Apes, the scene when the humans are in the crate, in the, in the, uh, you know, cages, cages you know, their, tre their cages and this and that, and it, it is all yellow, it's like a burnt field, that's what happens in Dream End. Now, have you ever waited, have you ever, you know, woke up and screamed, get your hands off me, you damn dirty ape? <laughs> Rook, how about you? Well, unlike Toy, I've been married for 27 years, and my husband was just a pain in the ass in my dream. Box. <laughs> <laughs> Those sweet dreams on that one. Tell me about a nightmare. Tell me a nightmare. Do you Seriously. sing in your nightmare? I sing in my nightmares. <laughs> no, you know, I always have this one. I don't know why, but it's uh, my ex-boyfriend. I was with him for like 11 years. For some reason, I can never find him in my dreams, nor do I know why I'm looking for him. I just keep going into all these different like tunnels and halls and then he just pops down and he's like, oh, I love you, I spent time with you. <laughs> and then he's like gone and then I'm like, wait a minute. And then I wake up and I'm like, you know, you're an asshole. <laughs> well, I, I have the actor's nightmare and mine, and, and it's a, I'm, I think it's what's called a stress dream, an anxiety dream. But it's called the actor's nightmare. And I've had this probably since the late 60s, early 70s, but I'm backstage, and there's the back, the, the back of the scenery made with the one by three, you know, a pine, you know, with the zigzag braces on it, and it's all laced with rope, uh, and, and I hide my script between the canvas part of the flat, the scenery flat, and the piece of wood, and I'm standing back there, and the, I, the lights go up, I hear my cue, 
And all I want to do is just check that first line. Because I know if I have that first line in my head, I can walk out there and, and, and then I'm, then I'm, I'm automatic because I'll hear, I'll be in the conversation with the other actor. And I can't find the script. Oh, and I panic and my, I'm laying in bed and my heart is beating now. I'm having this stress nightmare. And then it, it returns, it just, it repeats, it repeats, it repeats. I walk backstage and I'm doing a Shakespearean play. I'm in the tights, you know, and the boots. I think it's Merchant of Venice, I'm not sure. But I have it about everything. I have it if I have to fly to Cincinnati, you know, and do a con. I have it if I have to do a voiceover and drive up to LA. I have this dream, it's like a stress release dream. But it's so weird because it's on that loop, just like Nightmare 4, where I, the light, and it's so, prominent in the dream when the lights come up. The lights come up and I can look out and it's like 1971 at the Great Lake Shakespeare Festival in Rocky River, Lakewood, Cleveland, Ohio. Tom Hanks is an intern. No one knows who he is yet. Uh, the lights go up. I've got, I, I hope I look cool in my green tights. I check my cod piece. I hear my cue. I want to check my script and it's not there. And then it starts again. I, I crash around the bed. The lights come up. I hear my cue. But that's, that's mine. That's, uh, that's a pretty graphic dream with the god piece of everything. Well, you know, it, it's real important, you know. You, when you're doing Shakespeare, the, uh, the god piece and the merkin are very important. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Are we going to do some Q&A? Yeah, well, let's, we're going to have Stan come out with a microphone here, everybody. So make sure you put your hand up. What was your favorite nightmare killing scene? What was your favorite nightmare killing scene? My favorite, well, I actually have two. I, I like the uh, the cockroach is, is one of my favorites. And then Tina's death is pretty gruesome. And I, I think that one's really good too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, first, the first kill, Tina. So just a, a young girl in a white nightgown covered in blood. Okay, that just in freaks me. In a bag, <laughs> in a bag, like right? A Terrifying. <laughs> Well, Brooke's death is pretty great because it's very Franz Kafka, you know, Kafka-esque, because it, it, it echoes the insect of metamorphosis, and it's, it's such a pure nightmare, Brooke's fear of bugs and manifesting itself in the Roach Motel, which was really au courant and part of the popular culture back then. I mean, you guys love the line, welcome to prime time. <clears throat> And, uh, and uh, uh, that's taken from the television back then. That was the thing to get you to watch NBC, like, like must-see TV. Only back then it was Welcome to Prime Time. And that's where I got that line. I made that line up because the girl wanted to be a TV star. And the commercials for Roach Motel were like, uh, had been on for about three years when we shot that sequence. But it also has that wonderful, surrealistic Kafka-esque thing. But, Tina on the in the revolving room on the ceiling is a pretty great kill. Yeah. Anybody else? Toy, what's your favorite? Kill? Yeah, I'm gonna be. Yeah, exactly. It's Tina for me. Always has been. I was terrified to watch Nightmare on Elm Street. Well, it looks like Amanda Wiss. It's one. Yeah, she does. Where is it? Amanda, where are you? I miss Amanda. I, I'm gonna have to say, when I first saw the movie, I was I was younger and I was asthmatic myself. So your death got me yeah. just terribly because I, I went to, I went to bed freaking out that night I was like oh my god I'm gonna wake up I'm not gonna wake up <laughs> what a suck face <laughs> no sir I do not thank you very much for asking me we got uh, I wanted to ask uh, Robert what was uh, your favorite mo moment getting to work with the late great Wes Craven and if I could ask any of the panel what would be your favorite scene that you got to do in um, in the fourth film, and were you a fan of the franchise or before you even got to appear in, in the movie? Why don't you let the girls ask first, and I'll talk about Wes. Um, working with Robert's amazing. I, I think I say it every single time. No, but I have to come to Uncle Robert, but he's amazing. Thank you. Backstage, Robert. Uh, no, but it, it, honestly, it's coming in at 18 years old, and I was going to high school for the arts, and I was studying Shakespearean work and a the being a theatrician and meeting Robert, I had no idea that um, he possessed all this greatness. So then, all of a sudden, I got to work with him and he improv cutting of the apple. And I watched him do all these, you know, the, the body language and I was just like in awe of him. So working with Robert during my death scene and that actually took about a week to shoot. Oh, yeah. it said, I mean, it was just so long. Again. 
all these different special effects going on and casting and remember they had to rig a whole day i think for that overhead for the overhead yeah and then there was i think i'm not sure but i think they literally had it took a section like a trap door in the stage floor for a low angle it's a really dramatic low angle and that takes some hours and then also when the, they have mechanics in my face there's five guys under the table yeah. working that and so it was it was just you feel a, like you're on the muppets no honestly there was all these different <laughs> movements going on at once and it was just to watch and work with robert during that time um being stuck you know stuck in a room and it was, it was toy and i are trying to be you know real and and, and i'm dancing it a little bit because it's her it's her nightmare but but you know and, and toy's got to deliver and toy's got to going into prosthetics from her natural book but also there's a guy you know with his with his hand up your dress yeah pretty much <laughs> you know and all these leg, yeah. things were going on yeah. and someone was pushing me here and pulling me there and then he put the doll in and his teeth would fall out of his mouth and into my mouth and it was just like and the knives were real because it was a close-up but it was like really a lot of fun <laughs> robert you're not going to be able to get out of the building because i'm going to talk you up too Oh. <laughs> Robert really is the one thing that's great about Robert is we were all young and something I say on the panel too is he really took us under his wing and it can be really scary when you're working on a project of, of that somebody you know like you know Freddie and Robert and um, I so credit Robert for, for taking us under his wing and making us feel comfortable because it only makes your movie better when all the actors feel comfortable and he was experienced enough to know these green actors were coming in and, and he did that and he supplied that for us. So I really credit him for that. And yeah. Well thank you. But you guys have to realize it. And I don't I didn't I didn't help Lisa at all. You know, because Lisa was in, Lisa had 10 times more screen time than I did. You know, and we didn't always work together, but I knew that you guys were going to have to do effects. Yeah. And these are, they're all these beautiful young little method actresses. And I was worried about them pacing. You were just themselves. paying me. I was well, no, I was worried there. about you guys pacing yourselves, yeah. though, because I know that it's better to be 75% and have the light in your eye. Yep. than it is to be 100% and be off your mark. You and also that you know, if you deliver 100% and the effects aren't right, or the light's not in your eye, or the camera screws up, then we gotta do it again. And you have to pace yourselves, because like, like Toy said, you know, for our French kiss, took, took a week, because I rather like that. <laughs> Nightmare and what, um, what, what your favorite scene was? Um, well, um, let's see. My favorite scene would also be with Robert. I'm sorry, Robert. I told you not. You know, because I totally, this is crazy, but I really find Freddie sexy. I think he's hot. I mean, the way, the way he moves around and it's like, does his thing. Look at him right now. You know the way he like scats in and he has like a whole like dance thing that he does. Even when he's cutting the apple and his legs are up, he's just like dancing. Yeah, he's you like over at his stair. He's, he's got this thing. And I just wish that in our scene, I was hoping I could, you know, do a little more of a dance with him. But he picked me up so quick and I went into the fire. <laughs> so, but that was exciting. <laughs> all, I re all I remember is, I'd already never been outside before. And when we were shooting, you know, the shark, the shark claw, you know, the Jaws parody a, a, attacking Tuesday, I, you know, Tuesday's in a bikini, she's happy. But I, boy, it was hot. And I think, I even remember your makeup running a little bit yeah, that day. But I'd never been outside before in the Freddy makeup. And I'm all sealed up and it's like 90 degrees out. And I, my little brain was like bubbling, like a little egg boiling. <laughs> Robert, do you remember that I came, I went to set to visit you, and people found out through the radio, you know, some K-Rock, some local station that they, Robert was filming, and people showed up in thousands, and they started shaking the trailer. The trailer. Remember that? And when we were all in there, I was like, oh my god, we're rock stars. <laughs> No. We were we were in the, in the Robert's trailer, but that's all we're gonna say. Yeah. I, I signed I signed a couple of autographs, and one girl wanted her cleavage signed. 
you know. And uh, later on, I, uh, Howard Berger, the, um, the makeup man, uh, kind of helped divert the crowd, and I jumped in my car, and I just bought an 85 Mustang, you know, 5.0. It was fast, and I, I did my Starsky and Hutch slide into it. <laughs> and I zoomed away, and like 10 minutes later, I'm on the freeway, I'm getting ready to get off to, to my canyon in the Hollywood Hills to go to home, and I look over, and there's the girl that, whose oh, cleavage yeah. I signed on the back of a Harley, and they, they, and they followed me. So I went, I went to the next off-ramp and drove up, you know, uh, outpost. Went up that way, and I and I, I that's where 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 you grew up, yeah. where Toy grew up, and I lost them up there because I know that neighborhood really well too. <laughs> I wanted to know oh, it's Lisa, your favorite scene. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, okay. I gotta ask her. So. Uh, uh, favorite scene. Uh, I love all the church stuff. That was fascinating. I thought the set was so amazing. Wasn't it beautiful? And playing around on that and, and choreographing our fight. Uh, really enjoyed that. But I really, really love the scene uh, in the kitchen with my brother and my dad. And dad comes home drunk. And, and then he says, you know, what am I, a rabbit? <laughs> right? And Alice goes into daydream land and throws that bowl in front of his face and screams at him. And I love the power of that scene. And I think something we can uh, we could all relate to in our in our life, like you really want to say something, it's only you can only do it in your mind, you know. And um, anyway, I just thought that just added such a human element to uh, you know scenes like that add this human element to that we can all relate to. So, but, but like the bug, like, yeah. like the bug, you know, and Brooke, you know, which which is Kafka esque. That's also a nod to uh, uh, Louis J. Carroll. And Alice in Wonderland, because rabbit, you know, is the is the rabbit from that's that's the connection there, and and the theme and the symbolism, but it also breaks us into breaks you into a dream, another nightmare, and I love those little thin layers always being exposed in the movies. What did you want to know about Wes? Well, I worked with Wes on on. <coughs> part one and part seven, and Wes wrote part, a lot of part three. So there's great writers on part three, on Dream Warriors. Um, I didn't know Wes that well on part one. He left me alone. He had a lot to worry about, uh, the least of which actually was me. They were worried about the makeup, uh, and they were paranoid about the makeup. Uh, but other than that, he, he sort of let me go. Um, on part seven was great, because it was a, a really reunion thing. But Working with Wes wasn't, for me, the best time was when I did a TV series with Wes in 1995. Uh, and it was originally supposed to be called um, uh, Terminal, Terminal Bar. And they, they, the network made us use the word nightmare in it, so it became Nightmare Cafe. But it was purgatory. It's a diner that's purgatory and you get your last chance. And every episode was different. We had wonderful actors, Jack Coleman, uh, just great, great actors. and. I got to hang with Wes a lot then, and Wes was writing on the set, it was the first time I saw a laptop on a set, and directing, and, 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 and we were figuring it out, and figuring out our characters, and uh, that's when I really got close to Wes, and he would come to my, my uh, I had the best apartment there, because I scored one right up on Stanley Park, which is the best urban park in, in North America, it's in Vancouver, and I had my dog up there, and my dog was treeing squirrels, and, and being finally, my dog was finally a man, you know, up until then I think he just laid around and peed, but anyway, um, uh, they used to come over, Jack and Wes, and we watched SNL every Friday night, or Saturday night, and got drunk, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm good red wine that Wes would bring, and Wes, during the uh, famous Dana Carvey sketch, uh, uh, Head Wound Harry, Wes lost and, and turned into a little boy in front of me. And it was that moment that I know the, the whole barrier of him being my, my Dr. Frankenstein and, and, and my mentor and my director and my boss kind of went away and he was my friend. My, you know, so that's my, my best story about Wes. I'm still mad at him. You should be here. Yeah. Now one thing that you had said there, you, you had mentioned you looked over you saw the girl whose cleavage you had signed on the back of a Harley, and they were following you. 
I was kind of wondering about that earlier. Did any of you have any kind of odd fan interactions after the movie came out that were just like, mind but Maybe you didn't have to sign cleavage or anything like that, but <laughs> is there something that kind of... Uh, yeah, actually. Um, I had a really weird experience. It was really scary. Uh, there was this uh, guy who kept calling me and he would, all I could hear on the other side of the phone was me talking in Nightmare on Elm Street. So, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm saying, but I was like, wait a minute, this is Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm like, hello, hello, nothing. So he kept, he kept calling me and he kept calling me. And then finally one night I was, I was sleeping and I had my dog with me and my cat's in the kitchen. And um, I heard like some across the, the wood floors. And so I got up and I went to turn my light on and it was unscrewed. And I went into the living room and everything was unscrewed. So it was really scary, and I opened the door to my kitchen, and I saw this guy's legs climbing out of my window. So it really freaked me out, and uh, yeah. luckily they caught him, but what he had told them is, is that he had gotten my information, knew I was in the movie, and got my information from our bank, and he just came over to my house, and, and that was really scary. I put, a, I, I put a lamp, it was really dark on the side of my house, so I put a lamp out there, Coming up, coming from my house, like plugged in, and I lit it up. And my, and my landlord was like, "What are you doing with a lamp outside?" <laughs> I'm like, this, I'm, "I don't want this guy. To, I don't want him to come back." You know, but it was really, it was frightening. I moved out of there. And I understand that uh, exterminators would follow Brooke around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something back there. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Once. I do have weird fans. <coughs> well, I had an interesting thing happen during night before. We were about halfway through filming, maybe a little more. And uh, it's been a long day. It's about 1.30 in the morning. And I, you know, I wear, I wear glasses to drive. So I parked into the garage and I'm walking up. And walking up to my back door and I, there's these, these huge white sneakers with a person in them. And I'm like... I look up and up and up and up and there's this huge man. Oh my God. And he proceeds to put his massive hand over my face, actually oh. popped open the lenses. Uh, I struggle. I think I'm going to be killed. And my first instinct was to cover my heart. Anyway, he throws me on the ground. I'm like, oh my God, this is it. And then my neighbor upstairs heard something and pulled up the window. What's going on down there? And thankfully the guy... I landed on my handbag and my script bag that had my camera in it and my script with all my meticulous notes, you know, keeping track of who had died and this and that. Anyway, he pulled the strap, ran away, police come. Anyway, my husband comes running out the door with a butcher knife, <laughs> ready to strike, okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was a horror film, I'm telling you. Police came, whatever, and, and anyway, it turned out it was this guy, and another, his, whatever, the other guy, accomplice, was robbing cars in the other garages, so he was like the night, the, the night watchman, basically. Anyway, so, he wasn't a fan, and he probably threw away my dang camera, not knowing what the heck he had in his hand. Anyway, that's my scary story from Nightmare. I've never had a bad Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, I have my Elm Street, which you would, and you would think that maybe after all those movies and all those years that I would have a weird Nightmare on Elm Street uh, fan story, but I don't. But when I was doing V, which was my uh, uh, science fiction series, I had a, a, and, and I became sort of a fan favorite on that after the first four hours of the miniseries. There was a girl, a really smart, bright girl, who literally was obsessed with my character and wanted to be me. And she literally uh, put ace bandages around herself here to make herself flat. She permed her hair so that she had curly hair like mine. She wore a little bow tie like my character did. And I would see her at cons like this and I just thought it was cos or cosplay. And uh, I went to give an award to somebody, uh, Emilio Estevez or somebody at SC, I had to give an award out. And she was there and I finally realized it was getting a little stalker, stalker. And uh, I sat her down, I remember outside in the student quad at USC, and uh, she had sent me ideas for the show and they were great. 
you know, not all of the ones we get are great from fans because they don't realize the sort of <clears throat> things that are in, indicative of the, of the story that must remain in it. But hers, she had some great plot ideas for the television series V. And I told her that, and I encouraged her, you know, not, not be obsessed with me or the character, but to channel all that energy into writing. And she did. And I think she, I think she wound up selling a couple of uh, screenplays or teleplays, TV scripts, eventually. But that's the only weird story I've had. And I keep expecting it, you know. I keep expecting something weird to happen, but it never has. I think it's because that ultimately the films are, are, are great entertainments, you know. Nightmare fans are the best. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I tell you, I think, and this is just a kind of, I only know this because I'm getting real old now and I have a hindsight on it, but so many of you, or your mothers and fathers, or your brothers and sisters, or relatives and friends, so many of you discovered our movies on video and DVD, which meant, you know, you could bring it home, go to the mom and pop video store, or go to Blockbuster, remember Blockbuster? God, I feel old. Or, you know, and you get the DVD or the Blu-ray, or the new expanded version with extras, you know, the true story of Tuesday night, and all these great things that were added to them. But you watch that in your living room, or in your bedroom, or in your dorm room, alone with the lights turned down. And it's a more intimate relationship. Uh, and, and we did it. There's a lot of movies. So over the years, there's a nice spacing of it. And so I think we got a real loyal fan base. And we've sort of become the It's a Wonderful Life of Halloween now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, There's always a marathon somewhere on Halloween of the Nightmare Films. And I think that that has, uh, you know, engendered a kind of loyalty with our fans and, and from us to you that we really like. Speaking of Blockbuster, I love the horror it's oh. a blockbuster. Oh, it's a blockbuster. Oh, it's a blockbuster. Oh, Isn't that adorable? That's great. They're so that cute. That may be the best t-shirt so far in the comments. I want one. <laughs> right, let's see, we had a question back here. Let's see what, the, what we got. Hi, uh, first of all, it's an honor to even be addressing the five of you, but I was just curious whether it's a line that you've said yourself or if it's a line that somebody else has said, what's your favorite one-liner from the entire franchise of the movies from anybody up there? Well, mine's really dirty. <laughs> it's not the one you think it is. It's from Freddy vs. Jason. Oh. Don't worry, princess. The first time tends to get a little messy. <laughs> my, my favorite is actually an Alice line, and it is, evil will see itself, and it shall die! <laughs> And the sale, the souls are released. You know, it's funny. I've never been. Yeah, I've never thought about that question, and that's really good. Um, but I think for my character, you know, it's two things. Going back to the previous question about the weirdest thing, a lot of times what I get is um, young women coming up to me saying, "You know, I'm a scientist because of your character." I'm like, wow, you know, that, that's strange to me because I couldn't even achieve that. Um, but then second, when I say the line, mind over matter, because I still regard that as some truism for my life right now. Like, I can do anything if I put my mind to it. So it's one of the best lines that I think still carries over for me in real life. Um, only because I can't think of any other lines right now. <laughs> I think I really like I really like um, when you're in the uh, when Joey's in the waterbed and Freddie gets him and he goes, "How's this for a wet drink?" <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. You're gonna have to catch me in the next con. I gotta think about that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> the one that still gets to me is um, when Ricky Dean Logan is Carlos and he, he's the map is just all over him. He's in the back of the van and the map's all over him. And finally he gets to the center of the map and he's like, it just says, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're asking, they're like, well, what does the map say? Where do we need to go? And he's like, the map says we're fucked, man. <laughs> that line just kills me every time I see it. All right, what we hit, we're right over here. Uh, what was the 
was the funniest thing that happened during the movie? I, I got one. <laughs> I can answer this one. For me, um, so in the garage, I think it was the garage, the garage scene where I'm working out, um, they had pre-lit pre the set, and they were off in a different set shooting. They said, we want you to get into the box. So I'm in this box with my head sticking out and the fake body on top. And um, so, so, yeah, so, so they're like, they set me all up. I got all the prosthetics, everything's blue, we're ready to go. And, know it's always hurry up and wait so we hurry up and like an hour goes by two hours go by and I'm like I gotta be <laughs> <laughs> and they're like oh my god we're gonna we have to take all the aesthetics off and go, can, can you be in this Dixie cup <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I, they, they literally ask me Yeah, no, you gotta get me out. I can't be in a Dixie cup. So that was the funniest thing that happened to me. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what I did in the funnel. What about anyone else? Funniest thing that happened on the set? What was fun and kind of funny to me, anyway, was we were doing all the church stuff. We had these amazing stunt doubles, and some of these gals were Olympiads, right? And um, and I did some of the gymnastics. I could start, the, you know, do a cartwheel and whatnot. But these women were on wires, flipping around, and all that. So when we're filming, and we were in the church quite a quite a while, um, <laughs> I come to, I'm in my costume, you know, the, the warrior jacket, the ripped jean, you know, the whole thing. Well, guess what? There's four more of those running around, okay? Because you have to dress in the same outfit. So I'd be like, oh, there's five Alice's today. You know, so it was kind of amusing. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my my funniest one was when we were doing the, um, you know, the hand coming through the, yeah, yeah up on the beach, Jaws coming to get me and it was so funny because the way they showed it the movie was like all of a sudden like normally my legs were like together and then all of a sudden when they filmed that part my legs are like uh, about five feet apart and I saw that thing coming and I was just like about to go huh, because I thought it would you know come all the way up I don't know but the funniest thing is when I go under the sand and you put your foot on me and you are looking down and then you look up and you go ah! That is my favorite moment of the movie. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, like, funny or fun. Um, I do remember on part four, uh, the junkyard sequence. And I was exhausted. I had done another movie just before we started. And we were way out deep, deep in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, in, in Pacoima, I think. And it gets cold out there. It's worse than the back lot at Universal Studios. It's just cold and brown flaw. It was like three or four in the morning and we, it was the first time I'd ever experienced video assist. Rennie Harlan was, uh, you know, loved the new technology. And this is the little screen and they were in black and white then. They weren't even color. It wasn't like today they have just, just monitors everywhere, uh, giant flat screens. But this was just one little black and white thing but you could see the scene you just saw and you could kind of paint yourself into the frame a little better because you, you saw what the camera was seeing a little better uh, and I remember Rennie taking me over to show me a sequence in the junkyard and just seeing the lights come on like the eyes opening in the cars like like them animating and coming to life and I love that and then he showed me a video clip of the rough cut, the rough editing of the whole sequence up until my entrance. And uh, it really gave me my second win, but it was so much fun to see that because it was the new technology. And yet, if you went back in time with me right now, four o'clock in the morning, we in a fleece jacket on and be freezing and watching a little tiny black and white nine inch screen, you wouldn't be impressed. But that, back then, that was thrilling technology because it was instant replay. You know, and we could see it. And plus, I got to see a rough cut of everything up until then because they were able to do that the day before. And uh, it really gave me a second one to do. But that's the kind of thing that happens on a set. It's just fun. It's yeah. thrilling. It's the new technology. And I'll just put a parenthetical in here. I read this great book about silent movies years ago. I think it 
think it's called and the parade passed by but they talk about up in hollywood in the foothills of hollywood and the girls know exactly where i'm talking about now underneath the hollywood sign there's a neighborhood and i we've all lived there at one time or another it's starting out as actors it's a great neighborhood and uh, uh that's where the original hollywood was and Agnes DeMille, as in Cecil B. DeMille, as in the Ten Commandments, as in silent movies. All of them lived up there, and the mothers and the wives and the children, every night, would hang sheets up. And they'd come home when, when, when the light went away. They lost the light. It's dark. And they'd have giant picnics, and people would ride up on horseback, and in carriages, and in beautiful Duesenbergs, old-fashioned, turn-of-the-century cars, and uh, uh, Model T's and Model A's. And on these sheets in the Hollywood Hills, when the Hollywood sign said Hollywood Land, because it was a real estate development, they all watched the stuff they shot that day. And every single day, they were inventing something new. And so the mothers and the wives and the children of these early filmmakers would see the first extreme close-up, or the first moving camera shot or the first shot done from a car of somebody on a horse, on a sheet, with the sun setting over Malibu. Nobody lived in Malibu then. And, and I just imagine that, that moment, you know, that moment of time, and, 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 and them responding to that technology. Just as little Robbie England sat there and Rennie Harlan showed me on a nine-inch screen everything they shot the night before, and I got excited. It must have been a wonderful time to have been a pioneer of filmmaking. Boy, did you have something? Uh, you know, it's been, I just have a little side note. Um, I don't can't recall anything funny on set, but I do recall, and you guys, I challenge you all to go back and watch the movie. Um, after my death scene, um, the gurney comes out of my body, and as it turns the corner, she looks like she's about two feet tall. You know, <laughs> and I was like, I'm short, but I'm not that short. <laughs> So we've got time for one more question down here. So first of all, I would like to just as well say that it is a pleasure to finally get to meet you, Mr. England, and that also includes the rest of the cast sitting before me. Well, I um, hope so. <laughs> obviously. Anyway, um, I spent like the past few years of Warhound, like always, like saying hi to Kane, your best buddy, just about every year. Uh, bless him, whatever it is he's doing now. Um, but anyway, right to my question, um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but way before you were actually put on to the role as Freddy Krueger for Night Brown Elm Street, you, there was another movie that you did at one point, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I actually forgot what the name of it was, but my father told me that you somehow got burn marks from that movie, and I was kind of wondering, um, when you were put on for the role as Freddy, did you ever think to yourself, I don't know if the marks were actually permanent or not. Did you ever think to yourself that moment, the irony is stunning in the fact that you got put on for that role? Well, I, I don't remember uh, if I got burned on another flick. I, I did get burned on Nightmare 2 um, when I walked through the trellis that erupts into fire. Um, but the irony is that Kane Otter, who you were talking about, plays Jason in many of the Friday the 13th films. So, and Kane's a good friend, and Kane and I, Kane actually did stunts with me on V. Uh, we go way back. Uh, but Kane actually had an accident, a stunt accident, and has some burn scars on his neck. And, and, and it's funny because he plays Jason who's afraid of water. That's the metaphor there. Uh, and I play Freddy who's afraid of fire. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm the championship swimmer in real life. And, 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 and uh, but I play the burn victim, and in fact, Kane actually did deal with uh, his flames in a fire stunt uh, early in his career. And he's fine now, obviously. But, but that, I think, is the irony you're talking about. I mean, that's what your father meant uh, with that story. Because I don't think I burned myself uh, on anything before Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> We couldn't hear that. Ah. He, he wanted to apologize. He said that he could have swore that his father said that you worked on something before and that you got burned. So he said he, said he must have gotten a mistake. I'm racking my brain. 
you know, and I did 10 years of movies before that. But I can think of stunt injuries and love affairs, <laughs> but uh, I, I can't think of, and, and, and money I owed, but I can't, I don't think I got burned on anything before. I think that might somehow, that might have gotten tangled up with, with Kane's, Kane's backstory. All right, folks, with that being said, let's hear it for them one more time. Okay. Those questions were so good, I think you stumped us a little bit. Yeah. <laughs>